Hello people and welcome to the second day of this course. Today we are going to focus mostly on paper sensor and glass sensor. As I told you before, um, the sensor are most of the time used for an application. So when you design a sensor you need to think about what you want to detect. Uh, so that means the sensor design and the sensitivity of the sensor that you want to use. Where are you going to use this sensor? It's different if I want to make a sensor for Africa, for example, or for the Netherlands. It's different if I want to use it at room temperature or outside. You always need to think, where do you want to use this sensor? Third, when. So for how long you need to use the sensor. Do you want to leave a sensor outside in the field for one year for monitoring something? Do you want to use it as a point of care and you need the answer as soon as possible? This change how you want to make the sensor. Who is going to use it? Um, it's someone that knows how the sensor works, that knows a little bit of chemistry, or it's someone in a hospital, is it someone at home who is going to use it. Who is going to use uh, will change the interface that you're going to use. Is it possible to, for them to mix some solvents before doing the experiment or not? And naturally, how much it will cost. Most of the time you are developing sensor for a company or for an application, and the cost is always something important that you should keep in mind. Today we are going to see paper versus glass. Uh, both have, have pros or, and cons. The paper, for example, it's really cheap. Uh, you can produce it in tons without any problem. You can detect the analyte by eye. You can do in field analysis because you can bring it everywhere. You can ship it everywhere. Um, it's sturdy. So hypothetically, you can throw it from an airplane and the sensor will be still okay. That's not a problem. And it's easy disposable because naturally you can burn it. So once you finish the experiment, you burn it. And this is especially important for biological application. So if you're testing blood, for example, you don't want to contaminate anything else. Then after the experiment, you just burn the paper and that's it. Glass, on the other hand, it's more fragile, but you have a high sensitivity because you can use the microscope. Then it's way more sensitive than a paper sensor. It's expensive because modifying, although the chemistry is similar, modifying it, it's more expensive. You need more resources and definitely it's fragile. I cannot throw it from an airplane and hope that the glass survive. Moving on the paper sensor, the first thing that I want to do is moving liquid on a paper and I want to move the liquid in a controlled way. I want to put a few droplets on one place and then I want to move it somewhere else. What's the best way to do it? Let's say the simplest way, it's not really to cut the paper in the shape that I want. If I cut the paper, then I put the droplet. The droplet cannot move anywhere else. It must flow in the design that I did. Another way of doing it, it's using hydrophobic barrier. If I use hydrophobic barrier, it means that the water can be all in one place, cannot go into the hydrophobic barrier. So if I'm designing something, the water must flow where the paper can be wet, cannot go anywhere else. You usually do this using wax. You can print wax or you can design, or you can draw wax on a paper and then you burn it, the wax was, goes inside the paper and that's an hydrophobic barrier so the water cannot go there. You draw wax on top of the paper, then you put it in the oven, the wax starts diffusing inside the paper, and that forms a real barrier in the paper. Naturally, you can do this also with simple crayons. Uh, you can just draw on the paper and put it in the oven, and that's your final barrier. This is what we usually do in the laboratory for making different paper microfluidics you can drive the flow of water wherever you want just by designing a shape or a channel in your paper. Another way is to use a photoresist. So what is a photoresist? It's a polymer that will polymerize using UV light most of the time. So you soak your paper in a photoresist. It's still liquid, so it's still bendy. I put a mask on top, this mask is black and transparent, then I shine light, the photoresist will cure only when where the mask is transparent, and then you wash away the liquid photoresist. So at this point, your photoresist, the cured photoresist, it's inside the paper, and that's going to be your barrier. For both cases, I actually have a problem, and the problem is the diffusion inside the paper. 
if I use wax or if I use a photoresist, they will start diffusing inside the paper. This means that I cannot do something really, really small as a barrier or something inside. So if I try to design 100 micron channel and I want to put two barriers near this 100 micrometer, it's impossible because the liquid, as soon as I put both the liquid or the wax, they will start diffusing inside and then my channel is clogged. That's one of the main drawbacks of paper microfluidics. I cannot have really small channel because I have diffusion inside the paper. That makes sense. But on the other hand, with paper I can do something way fancier than just a single channel. For example, do you have any idea how to make this? Those are different channels and they are going on top and on the bottom of a different channel. It's very complex uh, microfluidics. How to do this? It's called, it's called origami paper microfluidics and you can design your channel on different sides of the paper and then you can just fold it on top of the other. If you use the barrier in a proper way and if you design the, the channels in a proper way, when you fold it then you will have multiple channels going up and down. And this is simple paper. Eh? This is pretty amazing because it's simple paper but then you have multiple channels and you can mix different reagents in a single channel, in a single microfluidics. That's pretty impressive. Similar things you can see it here. So you fold the paper in different ways and then you can uh, mix different reagents inside just by simple paper microfluidics. With paper you can think also about using some electrodes. So you can make a little bit of electrochemistry or electrochemical detection of some analytes. And this is still everything on paper. So if you can print two different electrodes, you can use this one for the detection of, for the electrochemical detection of an analyte. And again, it's, it's, it's super impressive if you think that this is just paper. There is one very important thing to note and how the reagents are put on the paper. Are those physiosorbed or are those covalently attached? Physiosorbed means that you can wash away the reagents that are on paper. They are not attached strongly on the paper. This one, it's a, it's a clear example of uh, pH papers, for example. I will show you in a few seconds. Now. With covalently attached, it means that my reagents are chemically attached on the paper and they will not move from there. You cannot wash them away. This is, for example, a classical example of pregnancy test. If you see the lines in the pregnancy test, you are not washing them away, but they are still in the same position. And that's because you want to capture your analyte while on flow. You don't want to wash everything away. How to do the covalently attached? Well, paper is mostly formed of cellulose and in cellulose we have plenty of hydroxyl uh, groups. All those hydroxyl groups, all those alcohols can react with a silane. And if I'm using a silane, then I can covalently attach something on paper. The reaction is pretty easy. You just need to spray the paper with silane. You need to heat it up and that's the reaction. So you start from an alcohol from the paper, you attach a silane, and then depending on the mole molecule that you attach here, you can also continue and go on with multiple reactions. So in this example, you start from paper, you attach an amino silane, and then I'm using the amines for making another reaction that in this case is attaching a biotin. So you can do multiple reactions directly on paper. In this point, I have not only a covalently, attach molecules on the surface, but they can, I can go on and make other reactions. And this is exactly the same reaction that we are using for modifying glass, for attaching molecules on glass. So this silenization is the reaction that we use also for glass. I will leave you for now and then in the next video we will see the pregnancy test, how it works. See you later.